Hello, and thank you for joining us on Constructive Conversations, the podcast that dives deep into the chasm that exists between contractors and their customers. Our goal is to improve communication between contractors and their customers by interviewing people on both sides and gleaning the keys of how to have your construction project go right. We are going to talk to home builders, people who have just had homes built, renovators, tradespeople, people who've undergone major renovations, and we're going to find out what went well, what got missed, and all the crucial steps that you need to hit so that your next project is completed without a hitch, whether you are a contractor or a customer. Today on our show, our guest is Lyndon Smith. Lyndon, thanks for joining us today. Nick, thanks so much for the invitation and thanks for having me on your show. Thanks for being here. It's my pleasure. So can you give us a little bit of background about your company and what you do? Sure. So we run a small business consulting firm called Expansive Edge. We work with the small to medium sized businesses, typically in the trades, and we build their business playbooks. You might be wondering what a business playbook is. Imagine all your company's vital information, your vision, your mission, your culture, your values, how you operate, the technology that you use, as well as all your standard operating procedures for each and every division that you have, and um, your company policies and all the roles and responsibilities, all housed in a central digitized platform that is easy for your team to access, consume, and use. That's a business playbook. So we work with teams to extract their information and to basically build these, these playbooks for companies. That's great. And what kind of trades, what does your typical company you work with look like? That's a great question. So we, we target the trades. It's a world that I know. It's the, you know, I, I, get, I get the people in the trades. And I, I also feel like the trades are the, the lifeblood of our economy. You know, without the trades, we wouldn't have, you know, clean water and sanitation like in our homes, right? We wouldn't have the homes that we live in. We wouldn't have the infrastructure to have these calls, right? So there's a whole lot of, you know, development that, uh, that the trades do that contribute to you know, like how we live these days and, and, and the lifestyles that we live these days. So I'm a massive advocate for people that are in the trades and where I see myself supporting the trades is really, you know, these are guys that, that go in, they've got a qualification, they're great at what they do, but you know, they fall short in some areas in their business. And that's really where I'd like to step in and support them and empower them to, to really grow their team, grow their crew, grow their business and create something you know, that's, that's bigger than what they could imagine. That's great. From being in the industry, I've noticed that's very common in the trades is that they're not organized. They might be good at what they do, but, but they're not great at running the business aspect. And then that trickles down to the negative customer experience. So. I want to dig into that a little bit. So the, the focus of the podcast is the conversations between the contractor and their customers. So walk us through a little bit. What does it look like for a company when you come in and you help them get organized? What sort of shifts do they start to see? If we're looking specifically at your relationship or your customer journey, what that looks like is when we start creating systems within your, or standards rather, within your, within your company, there's a journey that your customer will customer will experience. And once you've mapped out that process and you've got that as a standard in your business, you can take them consistently through step-by-step step, through that journey, through that process and ensure that they're getting the same, the same sort of service every single time. So it's, it's think about if you had to go for, for a haircut, for example, and one week you go for a haircut, they, you know, they give you a cup of coffee, you know, they massage your head, they, you know, like the, the service is just amazing. And then next week you go to the same place and that customer experience is just awful. You know, like you're not greeted with a smile, you don't get the coffee, you're, ex you're anticipating this head massage as part of the experience. And all you're getting is you know, a great haircut, but there's all those other components that are missing, right? So you want to map out that process and standardize and document that process and train your team to run through that entire process consistently every single time. So a great example is, what's the guy from McDonald's, Raymond? I forget his surname now. <laughs> of course, if you walk into any McDonald's anywhere in the world, I mean, you, you, you 
kind of have a really good idea of what to expect, you know, what the result is going to be. And that's the same concept or principles that we're trying to, you know, trying to, or that we're creating rather with, with our clients is when they're working with their clients, that same consistent experience that, you know, that, that whoever referred them to the business, that they're going to get that same, same level of service. And do you think that the lack of systems is sort of more endemic to trades if you compare it to a technology company you know their systems are on a computer they're there so do they tend to have more systems in place and the trades since it might just be a guy driving around in a van are they more likely to not have those systems and to not get them in place i think businesses in general doesn't matter if you're in tech if you're in marketing, if you're in HR, doesn't matter what line or industry of work you're in, there is always going to be a lack of systems or processes if, if it's not a priority by the business owner. So to answer your question around being in the trades, a lot of tradesmen have systems, they have processes. The challenge is it all lives in their head, right? So... The first step is, is just extracting that knowledge and that information out of their, their minds, their brains, and documenting it. Even if it's just as simple as doing it on a piece of paper or a spreadsheet, Word document, process flowchart, you know, just extracting that information and making it available for people to consume. The next step is actually putting it into like a knowledge hub where everybody has access to that information. And you know they can either contribute to it or or consume it, right? You find when you work with the business owners to extract that information, is it harder for them to get it out of their head on paper? Is there strategies you use to get that information out of their head? Yeah, so we need to know what we're trying to extract out of their minds, right? So there's a structure that we would follow. And I've got some templates that we use to kind of prompt our you know, prompt the, the conversation. Look, these templates are, are not going to be sort of cookie cutter for every business, but it gives the business owner an idea of, oh, yeah, we do that, you know, and then they can document it or no, that doesn't necessarily fall within like our typical process or procedure that we run. And then they can eliminate. So those templates are really just, like I say, they, they're, it's never going to be cookie cutter for each business. Each business operations are going to be different. doesn't matter if you've got two mechanical companies, 10 plumbing companies, 10 electrical companies, their systems are all going to vary, right? And that varies based on their unique selling proposition, who they are for their clients, their culture, everything else that, that, is, you know, like that, that creates the business effectively will kind of drive their systems. There will be some standard processes, you know, that would be industry standards, so like health and safety, you know, certain things like that. How they run their, their sales will be driven by the, the technology that they've adopted, right? So they may have a CRM system, let's say HubSpot or Zoho or what's it, Pipedrive, you know, they may have a CRM system that requires a different process. So each business, depending on the tech stack that they have in place, will have a different, like I said, it wouldn't be a cookie cutter approach. Okay. And so I, I have experience with SOPs. I was on the fire department for six years and they have <laughs> thick books on SOPs and procedures <laughs> and very detailed, right? There's a lot they have to do and they have to do it and be able to justify in court, right? Why did you knock out that window? Did that cause the rest of the house to burn down? So my question is, how granular do you aim to get when you're when you're helping business owners create these SOPs or how granular should should they be aiming for? That's also another great question. The more detail you can give your team and the more clear you can make every step in, in those processes, the better. Uh, you create those standards and that becomes a company standard. As soon as you start deviating from anything, then you start deviating from the standards that you're creating in your business. So you were talking about the that, that big thick book that you had, right? And I'm not sort of addressing I'm not addressing your question here, but I, I feel it's important to to raise this, you know, this this point. So how effective was that book in, in delivering the content to yourself? So, Oh, there was a lot of there was a lot of that that I ignored, or or the email would come out. Here's a memo regarding updated SOP, and I I couldn't be bothered. Um, right. 
to read it because it was yeah. a lot of it was it's almost like a legal document or or like almost like legislation so yeah i don't know if the lawyers had input into it but a lot of it's not uh, very accessible language well that's so important so the language that you use and the media that you uh, use to 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 transfer that knowledge is also super important so are you familiar with the term vac no no no. So it's like your learning modalities. So it's visual, auditory, and kinesthetic is the acronym. And it's basically three different ways that people consume information. So they consume, they're either visual learners, auditory learners, or kinesthetic learners. And typically the trades, because they work with their hands, they'll be kinesthetic, predominantly kinesthetic type learners. And these guys either, they learn best from, you know, by either doing the work, you know, hands-on approach or through video. So consuming information through video. And what we do is we, we, once we've got a written procedure, like you say, that language may not land with everyone, right? So we can supplement that with visuals. So graphics, we can supplement that with video and why video is a really valuable uh, component of creating those SOPs or supplementing those SOPs rather it touches on all three of those modalities. So you're watching visual, the, the actual video, you're listening, so the audio component of it, right? And then you're also, you know, once whoever is delivering that, you're listening to the tone of voice and you, you're comfortable with them. And like, you kind of have a, a sense of like kinesthetic, that, that feeling of, you know, like I, I resonate with this person, right? Or so they, they can take that application, you know, watch it as they're busy doing the work as well and that's why it becomes valuable for like people in the trades to you know to to have those supplements in place as well okay i see so it's not just a list of documents for people yeah. to read through you you have multimedia so that it's actually engaging for everyone so, so there, there will be the written procedure. There will be like some multimedia we can put some explainer videos into that we can put or just a like a loom screen recording in there. So this is how you do it step by step and you can take them through that journey, right? You can talk them through it whilst they're busy watching the video as well. Awesome. So can you give the listeners an idea, maybe an example or a case of what it would look like before and after a trades business goes through and implements these systems? Sort of what are their struggles that they faced before and and what does it look like afterwards? Yeah, good question. So typical challenges for these guys are, you know, they are the resource in their business, so they can't take time off. Or if they do take time off, their business stands still, or at least components of their business stand still. So you know, they're always kind of in demand, right? So they can never walk away from their business and go on a vacation and really you know, truly enjoy the vacation. And another part of it is there's there are key person dependencies. So whilst they may be able to go away, then they have people that are in place to to kind of support the the business. There are going to be elements of the business that are that are neglected, and it also means that when those people, those key persons in the business, leave to go on vacation, or you know something happens, maybe they want to exit the business. Maybe they're they're they got a better job opportunity. And now you've got like all this knowledge in one, one resource and you haven't taken the time to distribute that information to the rest of your team, right? This could be someone in design, engineering, project management, right? You know, the guys that are maybe more dialed in with the systems, but they've never shared those systems with anyone else. So I like to look at the term chaos to control, which we've got a pending trademark on. And that's really what we do. We, we take that chaos to control. So. You know, we, have, we may have Bob and Joe working to a strict set of their own standards. And what we do is, you know, those standards may deviate. They may get the same results. But if Bob needs to work on Joe's project when, when, when Joe goes on vacation, you know, where does he start? Where does he pick up? And then when he comes back, you know, like, what is he coming back to? You know, so, so you kind of want to align everything and create a company standard, something that everybody has contributed to. And... <clears throat> that gets approved by management and then it gets published for everybody to use. What else is there? There's a few other, the challenges companies come across. It could be a, a business owner that's looking to, to exit. So they've, they've run their business for the last 20 or 30 years 
and they're looking to retire and they have absolutely no structure or systems in their business. Their business has always been reliant on them. So for them to be able to walk away from their business or sell their business, when they leave, like what, what is left of that business, they may be just buying the, you know, the, the company's, what do you call it, client base, maybe some assets, but they're never going to get maximum value for the 20 or 30 years that they've invested in the company because they are a crucial component of that business. So once you start introducing systems and the business owner can step away, that becomes a much more attractive business to an investor or a buyer. And <clears throat> because they can buy the business and you know, within a couple of months, everything's operating and running without the previous owner having to be instrumentally involved in the operations of the company. So they can get a lot more money or value for, for the business in the long run. Awesome. So really the, the key person, so if they, they retire, Without systems in place, they're taking a percentage of the value of that business to retirement with them because it's stuck in their heads. Oh yeah. So if if they can just get that out onto paper and and systematize, then they can make it available for sale. They can that can be part of the the transaction basically. Yeah. Huh. Awesome. Yeah, and I think to add to that, you know, there's also a time management component. So. If you've got structure and, and, and processes set up in your, in your company, when you're onboarding a new employee, it's as simple as running them through like a proper onboarding process and not having to use the resources around or you know, throughout the company to, to ensure that that person is effectively onboarded. You've got a good solid onboarding system. Yes, you're still going to have to engage with that employee. You're still going to have to bring them into the culture of the company. But in terms of the operations of the company and how the, the you know, like the vision, the mission, you know, the culture, the values, and then the you know, standard operating procedures of the company, for them to get dialed into that, they don't have to ask all the other employees. They can, they can work through the, 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 you know, the playbook and they can be, all right, if I've got any questions after that, you can then have those conversations with the team. You don't have to get someone to sit down with that person for four hours a day, you know, for a couple of weeks just to get them up to speed the system will get them up to speed, right? So that then allows, creates a whole lot more efficiencies, gets that person operational a whole lot quicker in the business. And then in addition to that, you're also saving time of the people that are in the company and they, they can still continue doing the work <laughs> that here is adding value to the company, right? <clears throat> yeah, so I'm hearing a lot of wins for the business there that, so there's efficiencies, Training mm -hmm. can be faster, it can be more streamlined. You don't have to waste other people's time in training because the system can be more self, more independent or self-managed. So I'm interested in going back to the conversation we were having before we started. Where did you learn about the need to implement all these systems? Like, where did that come from? Because like you said, not there's a lot of businesses that they just, they don't have systems and, and they're going through their business life without them at all. So talk about sort of the, the process that led you to realize that this is necessary and the benefits that come from, from systemizing business. Okay, excellent. So I worked in, in, I worked for a robotics and automation company serving the mining industry for really about a little over a decade. And I led their design department and also ran some projects uh, for the company. And I was responsible for creating processes for our teams and structure for our teams. And the ch I mean, I, I, got, I bumped up uh, against a whole lot of challenges. You know, culture was one of them. You know, where, where those documents are saved and, and ensuring that they're easily accessible for people was another one. <clears throat> Getting people just to simply read through it, right? I mean, you've spent uh, hours, countless hours and days and weeks you know, building these, these standard operating procedures for the team. And you know, does everybody actually read through it? Do they actually consume the information? Or is it just something that you're developing and then it goes into, you know, file 13 and there it sits, you know. <laughs> and then if someone has a question, you can say, well, our standard is this. Oh, but I've never seen that, right? So these are the challenges that I experienced, you know, throughout the years. I discovered going through that, you know, having those pains and those, that experience, when I moved into business coaching, I learned a lot more about systems and how to, 
how to effectively manage the change. When I completed my degree, I also went through an element of change management and I learned how to, how to start implementing change within companies and, and the value behind, like, you know, creating that culture of change, that culture of excellence. So it all starts with the top, you know, and that, you know, the adoption of, of, I mean, a system and a technology, you know, it's all very much the same thing. A standard operating procedure is a system effectively in your business, right? Regardless of how that, where that lives or how, how it's, you know, how it's, sort of stored in, 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 the, in the company's database or the company systems, it's still a system, right? And I learned a lot working with a whole lot of companies as a business coach. I, you know, I got the opportunity to work for a, a larger mechanical company here in, in, in Canada. And I got the opportunity to sort of develop and help them and support them with their systems. And when I left that company, I thought like, you know, there's a, there's a great opportunity here for me to bring this to a much wider audience, you know, make a larger impact on, you know, the construction and trades industry and you know, people that, that really need this, this, this guidance and support. So that's kind of what led me to where we are today. Awesome. That's a good, it's a good, a well-rounded background. So. Uh, I, w- I want to give you a scenario. So now, now I'm thinking back to the fire department and our SOPs. We would we would have a committee puts together an SOP, sends it out for review for whatever period, maybe a month, and it's open to comments by anyone in the com- in the we can say the company, the department. And then the day would come when the SOP gets implemented. Nobody had read it during the review period and a bunch of calls get made to the chief saying, you can't implement this. This, we don't agree with this. We don't like it. Sort of have you come up against stuff like that? Sort of that type of resistance and, and sort Absolutely. of how would you, how would you address yeah. that? Absolutely. So it goes back to the point of like change management and culture. When we, when we work with our clients, the first thing we do is we get the executive or leadership team up to speed, make sure that they are on board with everything that they understand the value behind what we're doing and how we're doing it, how we're implementing it, that they're dialed in with the uh, software or the, you know, the techniques that we're applying. Once we've got their buy-in, you, you're creating a vision, right? And it's the same thing with anything. Everybody then hooks their cart to that vision and you're working together to, to achieve the same objectives. So, so that would be the first step. And then, the next step would be to introduce maybe your middle management team, depending on how the company is structured, introduce the middle management team, get them up to speed, get them creating in this environment, get them reviewing, and then the, the rest of the company. So everybody else in the company, you start bringing them up to speed. So you, to answer the question, you really, what you want to do is you want to create that culture of excellence and that culture of agility within the business so that everybody is contributing to the, the the overall success of the organization and you're bringing them in through that vision of what you're creating and how you're doing it and the value that each of these systems and processes that we're implementing the value that that has for for the, the team as a whole right so once you can start painting that picture for them and they've got clarity on that then you have a, a much higher chance of of success I really like what you said there, creating the culture of agility. Can you elaborate on that? Sort of what's some, some tips that can, that can help create that culture? Yeah, it, it really, Nick, it goes back to what I was, what I was saying about, you know, just getting everybody on, on, the same, on, the same, on the same page, right? You like creating that vision. So why are we even doing this? You know, Simon Sinek start, wrote that book, you know, start with why. So we, we get into that, like why are you know, like the first, the first meeting I would have with our, with our clients, with the executive team would be, all right, gentlemen, or, you know, everybody in the room, like what, what is, what is it that you, what is the objective that we, why are we doing this project? What is it out that we're out to fulfill? And I get them clear on that and make sure that everybody in the room is clear. So the culture then gets r- driven from, from the top, right? And, and leadership is not really a way of, you know, like it's, it's not a way of doing or, you know, the things that they have in their company, it's a way of being. So it's their way of being that then starts filtering through the rest of the organization. I don't know if that, I don't know if that answers your question, like how to get everybody on board, how to create that culture of agility. 
the culture of agility, it, it, it's, you know, if your leadership team are agile and, and, and they, can, they can be dynamic in the decisions that they're making, that kind of filters and resonates through the rest of the organization. If your, lead, yeah. if your leadership team are sloppy and, and slow, that's going to resonate through the rest of the organization because that's they're leading by example. It's their way of being that is going to filter through the rest of the organization. Yeah, that's, that definitely answers it. That's really good. Okay, and so we've gone over you you systemize a business and and there's you know you've enumerated there's tons of benefits there's a lot of benefits that come from that um, and generally those companies let me know if I'm wrong they're gonna give provide be able to provide better service more consistent high quality service probably because they're more efficient their pricing is gonna be more competitive. So what I'm getting at is that from the customer perspective, they want to be hiring a company that has these systems in place. How can they check that, say you're someone who's gonna hire a trade or a company for a major reno, what's a litmus test they can do to see, is this company being driven by the seat of the pants of the person in charge, or do they have the systems in place that are gonna ensure I have a good outcome and it's not just gonna depend on how the crew was feeling that week? So that's a that's a good question. So what I've seen in in some of the clients that I've worked with is they actually create a summarized version of their their customer journey or their process, right? And what that experience looks like. And then in their proposals, they say these this is the journey we're going to take you through. This is what it looks like. So these are the systems that we have, right? Maybe going back to the point, like how do they know what's the litmus test? It's it's really comes down to them doing their due diligence, right? Asking the right questions, going in and checking the reviews. You know, have has someone referred this com company to me, or you know, am I just sort of doing some research on 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 Google and then figuring out like you know, who to, who to go to, right? So testimonials and and reviews are a great way for for a company to to demonstrate like this is what the experience will be like with us you know this is what what you can expect now i know there are some flaws in that you know it's it's not a i mean i i hired a company a moving company to get me across from bc here to to alberta and i based my decision purely on google reviews and i discovered later that you know they they were able to they they had a, a process or a system that they doctor those reviews and, and eliminate the, the poor reviews and whilst I you know like I think it's totally unethical you know these are the things that you've got to be mindful of you know like and and, and take it at face value for what it is and relationships are, are built of business relationships are, are built on trust right so if someone you know in your network has referred you to a a business and they've done work with them you you can tr I, I would say for the most part, you could trust that that uh, that referral or that you know that that person that they're pointing you to is giving them good service. It doesn't always mean that you're going to experience the same service, but it, it's probably one of the best best approaches to take. I, I would say. Okay. Yeah, that's good. So they can do their due diligence and then and then see if the company even has their process on their website. That's just plainly available or on their on their proposal that's, that's available for them to see, oh yeah, these people do have a process. They're not just yeah. making it up as they go along. Or I mean the other side of it is communication, right? So you could simply just ask them, you know, can you take me through through your uh, typical project life cycle or your uh, customer process? You know, what, what is this project going to look like? Right. And then they can explain it. And you'll understand or you'll see in, or you're, you'll hear in the listening of their response how effective their their processes are and how dialed into their process processes that they actually are. Yeah, that's really good. I'll I'll reiterate that. So the customer should ask the contractor to take them through the process, just yeah. on the phone, and then they can gauge from that answer: is there a dial-in in process that exists or not? So that's definitely a good question. Could you venture a guess as to how many trades, how many, you know, these small businesses are able to answer that question and, and have those systems in place? Is it so that that's your industry? So do you have a gauge of of uh, 
how many do or don't have that in place? I, I don't know. I, I would have to hazard a guess here and I would say very little. Probably even goes as far as saying like less than 10%. Yeah, I, I could see that. I always say if a contractor answers their phone when it's when it rings and replies to emails the same day, they're in the top 5% of contractors. So it's, <laughs> it's kind of a low bar, but yeah, yeah I, I can see that. Yeah, and also because especially the contractor industry is not regulated, so it's open, it's open to anyone to come in and, and hang their shingle, and they don't necessarily have to have any anything in place. Okay, anything else, you, any topic you want, uh, direction you want to go in in particular? I think, yeah, I, I'm going to maybe just share with you the components of a playbook and, you know, like the vital components of a playbook. I mean, anybody listening to this podcast, you know, they like they don't have to engage in our services. But when, when they're creating their playbook, some things to consider, right? So there are four key areas when we're developing our playbooks with a, or company's playbooks for them. There are four key areas that we look at. The first area is like all the company information. So as I mentioned earlier in the call, that company information could be, you know, having your vision, your mission, even your company's purpose, like what it is that you're out to achieve, right? All the company values, you know, these these are, you know, like you, you typically find these on like a company's website or, you know, they've done this work before, but it doesn't really mean anything. So like really getting attached to, you know, to this, you know, to these components and, and driving that, you know, it becomes a way of everybody in that organization. So if you value integrity, make sure that everybody in the company has integrity, right? And that they're operating with a level of integrity that that is you know benchmark in your in your company. So more on the on the company sort of pillar is uh, like your technology stack. So what technology are you using? So you you think about your sales. You know you you'll you'll have a CRM. You'll have your you'll have your marketing. So your website, your social channels that you're using. What you're using to develop any social social content where your blogs are housed, like all that kind of tech that you use. And then you start looking at operations. So what project management software are you using? You know, are you using like site docs to manage safety? Are you using Trello or Monday or maybe something more significant like Procore for your project management tools? So there's a whole lot of operational stuff that you can, you know, that tech stack that you can start unpacking as well. Finance, so are you using like QuickBooks or Sage or what does that look like? How the company uses it as well? How are you preparing your bids and your estimates? Are you just doing them in Excel? Do you have software for that? Or I mean, Excel is software, but do you have like a more sophisticated software? And then like that whole blanket with like your cybersecurity, how are you protecting your business? How are you protecting your database, your drive, your storage, you know, things like that? How are you protecting your information? So we start looking at like your tech stack and then just how you, you're using it. And then we can also start seeing, are there perhaps some integrations or APIs that exist to optimize the links between those, those technologies that you're using? Or perhaps maybe there's a better solution that you could use as well. So there's a few components that live in, in the first pillar, which is your company. The next pillar is your, your people, right? So this this comes down to having a solid organization structure or a roles structure. I think Michael Gerber from the e probably says it best, or he you know, created the concept of having a, a functional chart or an accountability chart. What that really looks like is you don't have your titles in the company, like the president, the op operations manager, the project manager, and then you know, the, the field guys. What it looks like is you've got the, the functions within the organization. So the function could be marketing, admin, you know, like all the different functions in the business. And then you've got like a, a people based. So who are those people? Because the president for a smaller company might be the admin manager, the marketing manager, the general manager, the, you know, the ops manager, and, and so on and so on. So once you start creating that and you see how many different roles you as the owner in the company or your people in the company are fulfilling, you can start creating you know, the, the opportunities to start filling those with new people as you're bringing, bringing them into the company. So you bring the right people into the right positions and they're a whole lot more effective and the people 
<laughs> that that are working on two or three functions or roles that can focus on on you know their singular role, right? <clears throat> what else is there on on people? Yeah, just having their responsibilities clearly defined. You know, I've joined companies in the past, and I'm sure other people have experienced this as well. But not being clear on what your roles and responsibilities are in the company. So just having a clear outline of of what I'm responsible for, right? These are my output, outputs. And through that, you can start generating some KPIs. You can align that with your company's uh, OKR, so your objectives and basically your goals, the company goals. And the KPIs are just a, a, a metric to measure performance, so key performance indi indicators, just in case anybody doesn't know those terms. The third pillar would be your policies. So here, think about your human resource policies, health and safety policies, IT policies, anything like that you want a place for that to live. And then the very last pillar would be your standard operating procedures. So here, what I typically do when I work with clients is I, I take a look at all the different departments in the company and I create a playbook for finance. I create a playbook for marketing. We create a playbook for sales, a playbook for operations. So we break all the, the departments up and then we create the playbooks for each of those departments and how all the procedures in there work. Yeah, so that's a very high level on those those four pillars. You know, and and if, if anybody's looking at you know, building their own playbook, you know, these are the things that they want to make sure that they've got inside there. That's great. Hopefully that's helpful to if there's any contractors in the 90% who don't have systems, then that's <laughs> definitely a great a great place to start. If not, they can they can call you and <clears throat> and get some uh, professional help with that. So anytime, yeah. Yeah. So on that theme, I'm so I'm I'm a fan of systems and and in my business I'm working to implement to implement that as much as possible. So I I want to sort of pitch this to contractors so that they can really drive home the value. So can you talk about the mindset, you know, sort of how that affects the mindset of the CEO or the the business owner? How does that change from going keeping everything in their head to having it systemized in place. Here it is. I can hand it off to whoever I need to hand it off to. So mindset's a massive thing, right? And you know, moving into a you know, systems thinking mindset is a whole new world for some people. Where people perhaps don't realize is that Every single day, they're running through a system. Right? You get out of bed, you brush your teeth, you, you shower. You know, there's a, a process that you follow. You know, travel to work, you know, read your emails. You know, there's a there's a process or a system that lives there, right? Although it's not written down and documented, not everything has to be. There's systems that we follow in our our daily lives, right? So, the point I'm making is, once once your business's systems are are documented, you know, even though, I mean, there's 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 systems that everybody in the company has. Your admin person, or you know, the person that opens the the door, you know, to the company every day and and locks up, you know, the alarm codes, the the keys that they use, where they keep the keys, um, you know, like how we greet people when they come into the company. That's a you know, that's part of a, a system, right? It it becomes part of your culture. So once that is communicated to the team. Right, and it's ex or extracted from your CEO or your president or you know the the company leaders' brains, so to speak, and and communicated to to your teams. It creates transparency, and that transparency, um, you know, in how we do things and and why we do things, and this is how you know, like this is what we expect the results to be from you know doing these things. It it gets everybody up to speed, and everybody kind of it, it changes the whole. The dynamic of of how things work in the company. So, how what is the value to the CEO, or what is what? Can you get me present to your question again? Just to make sure I'm hitting the yeah. Right so, here. so sort of what I'm getting at is how how does it affect their mental health basically to to not have oh. all these things jammed up in their head? Well, yeah, that's that's an easy <laughs> can. Uh, it's it's going to make it a whole lot better, right? Because mm -hmm. now they can start working on their business and not always in the business. You know, I'm sure you may have heard that term before, work on the business, not in the business. 
it gives them it gives them the space it gives them the time it gives them the the the, the opportunity to have clarity on so many other things that are going on it gives them the opportunity to actually run their business and grow their business right so in in, in terms of a mental capacity or a mental state yeah it frees them up it gives them the space that they need to 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 really be effective and contribute more to to the company to the organization and the people in the company make better decisions because we've got the you know like we've got the mental capacity and the space to do that now because i'm not bogged down in 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 trying to you know explain 20 different things to 20 different people every single day making sure that they're doing it right or that they know how to do it because it's in my system it's in it's documented it's it's, it's there and available for everybody to see is that a better answer yeah. to your question yeah yeah that's yeah. great so they're going from putting out fires and i've met contractors and it seems like they've been running the business for 20 years continuously putting out fires the whole time that's the one you where you see all the papers piled up on their dashboard yeah. driving around with their hair falling out so yeah so that that gives them the opportunity to work on the business and then they can start to improve and get it's almost like compound growth Absolutely. from that and then they really start to take off and, and they, they, as a result of that, become better. They become better leaders and the, the team that they have become more loyal because the owner is not focused on, like you say, putting out fires. The owner is focused on, you know, creating an awesome, be, being an awesome leader, right? And that leader, there's so many components to that. Being a great leader for their people being a great leader in terms of driving the, the direction of the company, finding new opportunities, growing the business, it's, it's really, it, it changes the whole dynamic of everything that's going on in the company. So, yeah. So that's just like you were saying, the leadership, the trickle down effect that, that trickles down into the culture and improves the company. So once the, the leadership has the mental capacity to to work on themselves and that translates down into the rest of the company and then the rest of the company sees the improvements as well. Yeah. Great. That's awesome. Okay. Any other um, Yeah, it's when people think of systems and and processes and procedures, it's uh, it can be quite daunting. It can be, you know, like if you're looking at it and you think, you know, this is a mountain of stuff that I've, I've got to, I've got to plow through to, to get it done, you know, and then, and then you end up avoiding it all together. The real change needs to come into that consistency. So that way of being, you know, and, and contributing towards your system on a continuous basis. So if you're doing, I think James Clear from Atomic Habits says it best, you know, that, that 1% improvement every day will make you 37 or a little bit more than 37 times better uh, than what you were by the end of the year, like within one year. So if you're contributing to your system on a daily basis and, and, and getting your team to contribute to your system in, on a daily basis, you know, the, the, that mammoth task that you have in front of you is you know, like it's a long, long-term thing. And you always got to consider your playbook and your, 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 your SOPs and your company as living documents because as your business grows and evolves and you start bringing on more people and taking on different projects, you're, you're going you're gonna to require new procedures. You're going to require new systems, right? And then uh, there was something else I wanted to share. I, was, I, I went to <laughs> a little bit. Oh, in, no, in, that's in good. Yeah, that's definitely really good to, to chunk it down. And then just work away at it. And then eventually you get through that mountain and, and then go yeah. from there. So off of that thought, what? so at that point, when somebody is working on their procedures or say they have all the SOPs in place and now they're in that position where they can grow, at that point, what do you see as becoming the barriers to growth? So now the company is rapidly evolving or growing. What, what new challenges start to come up at that point? Well, there's always going to be different types of challenges. You know, we can look at like microeconomic or macroeconomic challenges that come across, you know, industry challenges. But if, if, you're, if you're not focused on working in your business anymore and you're, you're, you're actually in a position where you can gauge what's happening in the industry, you know, there could be a slump in the market. There could be a massive uh, spike in, you know, in work that's coming in. 
and that you can you can then start positioning yourself to to take on those bigger projects or you know positioning your business to be a bit more resilient through the tough times you know where 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 there might be a slump in the market so you know, those challenges i mean we could have, i could have this conversation for, for the next four days on the challenges that businesses could experience challenges for trades i think it's just you know maintaining the culture that you develop in the company so always being present always being available to your team um, you know having that culture of you know this is the standard this is the benchmark and you know we this is what sets us apart from our competitors you know like there, there's so many challenges that can that, that can come up I'm just trying to think what what particular challenges could come up in the trades and i think it could just be you know like i say those those micro macroeconomic impacts that 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 you know you could sort of ebb and flow with in in the business so yeah. that's good then so what i'm getting is once you're no longer focused on on the fires at hand then you can start to have awareness looking forwards and into the future and then anticipate you know the waves coming in instead of getting hit from behind by them Absolutely. Yeah. Or you start moving into a mindset where you're not just surviving, you're actually thriving through, you know, the tough times because your business is positioned for that, right? Mm -hmm. Those companies that don't have the structure in place, that don't have the systems in place, it's likely that they're going to fall apart, right? They're going to have to shut their doors, you know, when things get really tough because they cannot secure the, the work or clients are going to come to your company because you've got you know the structure and they know they can trust that you're going to deliver on time you know where, where you know, those guys are just going to be competing against you on 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 price you know, that doesn't really matter at the end of the day but price is only a question in the absence of value i like that price is only a question in the absence of value right that's uh, yeah. that's good so you mentioned one of the challenges that could come up is maintaining the culture can you can you talk more about how how somebody can can prepare and and ensure that they can maintain that culture once they've established it and they're working towards growth? Yeah, this is a tough one, and I think this is what sets you know good businesses apart from like incredible great businesses. You know, guys that really really thrive. You know, the good businesses can have good strategies, they can have good team, but if they don't have good culture i don't know who says it but like they say culture each strategy every single day now if you've got a good culture in your business you've got a team that that are 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 willing to to go above and beyond they really can deliver results far beyond what your expectations are and you know i think culture comes from you know having integrity and you know, just being authentic with, you know, as a leader in your company, but also, you know, bringing people on that, that align with the, the culture, you know, being clear on what your culture is, right? Like who you are as a team, who you are for your clients and what that culture looks like. And then making sure you're bringing the right people on board because not everybody is going to align with your culture. And if you've got the wrong people in your business that don't align with that culture, well, guess what? That culture is going to shift more towards you know those people that you know that, that that could be like a sour apple you know or a, a bad grape or whatever the term is right so if you have someone in your business that is that is not aligned with your culture it's all you know, you know it's either best to have that conversation with them and it's communication is probably one of the key answers here is is have that communication with them and always be in communication with your team but bring them in and say you know like that's not how we do things here. You know, this is who we are for our clients. This is who we are as a team. You know, this is this is what we expect. You know, so always just having open communication with your team. I think is that's the you know the, the biggest point on on culture really. So that you know when 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 things go wrong, you always then look at yourself as a leader. You're like, where did I fail my team here? It's not pointing fingers at the person, but where did I fail my team here? Because there's something that was missing, right? It was either a system or a process. It was either communication. You know, there there was something that was missing for this person to to either believe that that behavior was acceptable, or that you know the service that they've delivered was acceptable, or that 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 it's okay. 
you know, we, we want to set a benchmark and make sure that everybody's living up to those standards in the company. So I think when it comes to culture, the keywords there are authenticity, communication, and you know, just like having those conversations, right? Being clear on what the expectations are. So like having that vision. And this is really like the first pillar that I spoke about earlier, your vision, your mission, your values. I mean, that's like at a very sort of low level or high level, sorry, what, what, what every business should have. Because if you don't have that, I mean, what are people really there for? What are they, you know, what is the business out to achieve and how are they a part of that, right? So, so just bringing them along that journey with you, right? Awesome. That's, that's great. I like, to, I like to ask this question to all the guests. What, what do you see in the future of the industry in general, in, in the trades in general? And in your case specifically, with trades becoming more systemized and organized, what are the trends you're seeing, at least uh, in, in the section of the industry that, that you're exposed to? Okay, good. So, I mean, like I'm relatively new to Canada. We've been here in Alberta for three months and in Canada for like two years and three months. So my observation of the trades or the construction industry here in Canada is that it is it is growing. It's growing at such a massive rate. You know, there's there's such a shortage of homes. And you know, I came out of British Columbia, and I know a lot of people that from from my home country, South Africa, that have moved to Ontario. You know, the the property prices are absolutely absurd, and, and I think there's a, a massive demand surge that's happening here in Alberta at the moment, because the homes are affordable, right? And people are moving from those provinces here. It's a beautiful country. It's a first world country. And, you know, it becomes very attractive for people from all over the world to come here. I know we attended a presentation from the economic de um, development manager a couple of weeks back. And he was saying that Alberta has grown in population by 184,000 people. Now, whilst that doesn't seem like a significant number, it is massive. I mean, if I take a look at construction, I stay here in a little town called Cochrane. I'm sure you know where, where it is. If I look at what's happening here, it's exploding. The construction industry is booming. You know, there's buildings being developed in every single direction here. And it's the same when you go to Airdrie. It's the same when you go to all these little towns. That corridor between Edmonton and, and Calgary, it also looks like that's going to be developed substantially over the next couple of years. So there's a lot of um, economic planning and development that's, uh, that's going on behind the scenes to, to accommodate all these new people coming into, into the province and into Canada, right? So systems, how do systems play a role there? I think, you know, like to answer that question, so how systems come into play here is, you know, if you want to land those bigger contracts or those bigger projects, um, you're, you're going to need some pretty solid processes and systems in place to to, to stand out from, from the rest of the crowd, right? Because there are going to be a lot more people stepping into this space to leverage that demand. But in saying that, I think the other challenge that I see with the construction industry or trades is that it's becoming aged out to a degree, right? And you know, a lot of like the youth are, are not as interested as you know, in stepping into a construction or a trades position, you know, they want the cushy office jobs. They want to be influencers. And where I'm seeing this, you know, the impact of this is in, in retail, in trades, and you know, like these kind of spaces where it's, it's customer facing, right? How we can mitigate that, I think that's a, a long, <laughs> that's a, a topic for a whole other conversation. But it's really just pumping the tires and 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 honoring the trades as an industry that is, like I said earlier, they are the lifeblood of our of our economy. You know, making sure that we're we're developing and growing businesses that have great leaders and that create meaningful workplaces, right? And that's what I'm out to achieve through through the work that I do is create meaningful workplaces. You know, employee retention is another component. You asked the question earlier, what is the value of bringing, uh, or what are the challenges? You know, if there are no systems in a business, employees don't like floundering around and waiting for, for you know, like information. They want to have access to it immediately. 
we're we're in an age where we have like Google and all these you know tools that are available to us, these AI tools now as well, and they they want information now, right? And if they can't get information on how to do their job, they're going to start looking for something else, right? If they if they not getting the leadership that they that they deserve, right? Because they're human beings as well. Everybody deserves you know good structure, good leadership, right? When they when they're in a company. And if we can empower leaders to, you know, to, to, to become that for, for their team and, and to grow their teams, that'd be awesome. Create more meaningful jobs. And, and like I say, honor the trades because they, like I say, they are the lifeblood of our economy. They, without them, we wouldn't have the clean water and sanitation. We wouldn't have the ability to have this coal right now because we wouldn't have the in- infrastructure in place to, you know, to jump on the internet and, and have a, an online call, right? That's great. Yeah, that's a great message. I like that. Everyone deserves good leadership, definitely. And I appreciate yeah. that your business works to create that and make more meaningful workplaces. So that's great. Awesome. Well, Lyndon, I appreciate you coming on the show. I learned a ton. So I appreciate your time and your insights. That's definitely is valuable to me. So I'm sure it's going to be valuable to our listeners as well. So So thanks again for coming on. Nick, thank you so much for having me on the call. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit with yourself and with your audience. And I'm looking forward to connecting with you and picking these conversations up as well. Definitely. I'm interested to have you you back on the show again for another one. There's some other, other topics we can cover, definitely. Absolutely. Anytime. All right. Thanks, Lyndon. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for listening to this episode of Constructive Conversations. Please share with your friends who are contractors and customers, people who have done big renos or builds or who have them coming up so they can learn how to have the right conversations around their construction project. I encourage you to follow the podcast because we have some very great guests coming up. We're aiming for one podcast per week, so make sure you're following. Thank you again for listening. Have a wonderful day.